in moderating this panel on girls' education advocacy, which is certainly an issue that is very, very close to me, um, given my work over the past few years and my absolute admiration for She's the First and the work that you all are doing with these nonprofit partners around the world. Um, the idea behind this panel is to really help you to become more effective advocates for girls' education and the work that you're doing on campus. And so we are thrilled to have you all here. And what I'll do is just to start off by um, asking our panelists a couple of general questions, a couple of specific ones to their work. And then we will open it up to your questions, so please do get them ready via text. I know that you'll have a lot to ask our panelists. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being here. And I wanted to start out with, uh, I think, something that's been a theme throughout the summit thus far, which is storytelling. And in many cases, the most powerful advocacy really stems from personal stories and people's uh, the ways that in which people have witnessed how education can transform an individual's life. And so I was wondering if we could start out by having each of the panelists maybe talk about one of those stories that you've witnessed in your work, in your travels, um, just to give us a little inspiration to get us going to this panel. Maybe, yeah. Sure, hi, good, good uh, morning everybody. I love the pink t-shirts and uh, I hope I get to take one home. They're just so awesome. Um, so my name is Maria Rosa Galtra. I'm the Executive Director for Africa And what we do is we focus on girls' leadership development in Tanzania. Um, so the story I have is um, I had the opportunity to sit and observe one of the classes that our mentors in Tanzania uh, give in once a week. And so I was there a couple of, um, I was there last March, but this story actually took place the year before when I was there in February. And I was sitting and observing uh, the class. Um, and the typical, you know, Tanzanian uh, girl tends to be shy, tends to be quiet, uh, tends to not look at you in the eye, um, tends to not raise her hand, uh, tends to be, you know, more submissive and, and quiet and um, doesn't really you know, put forth m much of her, you know, person, you know, personality into things. Um, and here I am sitting in this class, and I'm watching these these girls who are, who who have um, created skits. Um, and the theme of the skits is advocating for special needs uh, in the, the people with special needs in the community. And the skit was, our, the Kisa scholar uh, was going back to. Her back to her home, is this still working? Back to her home, sorry, um, to advocate to her parents um, for her little brother, and of course this is you know, all a fictional story, um, but her little brother was special needs, and she was talking to her parents about how important it was for her little brother to go to school. And here, this, this scholar is referencing things like the United Nations, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, she is talking about the um, the um, rights of the child and, and quoting all of these, you know, uh, um, you know, universal treaties on how we're supposed to treat each other. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is amazing that this young woman is finding this voice inside herself to be able to speak up for the rights of others. So it was just a very powerful moment for me, and I got goosebumps. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie. Um, my story, my really, the first um, emotional thing that really got me and, I don't know, made me change directions in my life was when I was your age, probably, <laughs> every girl or guy here, um, I took a gap year and I was traveling all around the world. Long story short, I end up by chance in, in uh, Nepal just northeast of India. And I wanted to go up trekking into the Himalayan mountains with a young Nepali friend. And in order to get from one sort of place in this trading post town to another, um, you had to cross this dry riverbed. And I'd have to walk across it every day, and every day I would see hundreds of kids breaking rocks. 
and they were girls and boys and just breaking rocks. And that is what they did all hours of the day. They had their mallets, and they'd go into the riverbed, they'd bring them out of the riverbed, and they'd break them into pieces. And I was just watching it. Um, obviously, it's enough to make you want to go into your pillow and just cry. <laughs> Um, I felt angry, I felt just shocked. Um, but then one day I cr was crossing the riverbed and I saw this little girl named Hima. And she was about six years old and she was wearing this orange raggedy dress. And um, she was digging through the garbage. She was a rock breaker. And it just hit me all at once, like a load of bricks. And I was like, well, I can't do anything about a million orphan children in Nepal, but I can do something for Hima and for this one little girl. And um, that was the first girl that I personally ever enrolled into school. It was like $6 for a uniform. And <laughs> you know, you just think, oh, I can do that. That's, that's something that I can do personally. And it's so overwhelming when you see the UN numbers and the statistics and we think about this massive problem, but then when you bring it down to yourself as an individual and then one little girl, it becomes so powerful and life-changing, and that's, I think, where the world gets better. Um, so that's my, my story. And now I'm a mom of 51 kids. <laughs> so. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Wanda. I'm from the Arlington Academy of Hope. Uh, my wife and my daughter, Christina, here attending this conference, and it's just amazing to meet you, to see you, and to appreciate you in person for the work that you do. Uh, I was born and grew up in Uganda, in a small village called Kumarukani. And for me, I do what I do with this program because of the personal experiences I had. I grew up in a very small village. I walked four miles to school every morning. Uh, like other kids in the school, I did not have lunch. I was hungry at school all the time. I had no teachers. And it was especially more difficult for the girls to make that journey to school every day because when they came back home, they had to do a lot of work at home as well before going to school and after coming back from school. And because of all of those challenges, less than one out of every 10 kids who begin school actually finish elementary school. A lot of kids drop out of school because the challenge of, challenges of attending school are very, very difficult. So I consider myself very, very lucky. I lived that story. I was able to go through school and finish school. And I was even more lucky to find myself in this country. So for me, I basically consider it an obligation to sort of work with the kids who we left behind in Uganda. Because we know a lot of them are very, very talented kids. Very, very talented. They just need a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of help. And every small thing that you do here, Everything that we do through the program that we do and with all these partners here makes a very, very difference with a big difference with these kids. I have lived that story, but I also know when people look at me here, they know that even from that small village in Africa, you can make it all the way. And I want this girl in Uganda to know that they too can make it. John, if we could just stay with you for, for one minute, um, specifically for you because of your program. Arlington Academy of Hope is based in the village where you grew up and where you come from. What changes have you seen since the time you grew up for girls in the community? What has gotten better um, versus what are the things that still need to improve for girls? There are so many changes. We have worked on this program for 10 years now, and even in the 10 years, the changes that we can see in that community are immediate and public. Because number one, for the parents in the community to believe in their girls. Uh, you had Anna speak yesterday saying that a lot of parents don't want to send their kids to school. We began our program with a special focus on girls because we wanted these parents to know that their girls were as important as the boys. And so in our school, once we began the school, the requirement was at least 50% of the students must be girls. This was new in the community and over time, Today, as we speak, 57% of our students are girls. And this has made a big difference in the community because now parents can say that kids, their girls can go to school and succeed, and our girls do better at school than boys. This is 
teaching and lesson to the parents, but also to those in authority, the teachers, the government officials, to realize that if they put their emphasis on girls, they can actually trans transform the community. Uh, in Uganda, we have uh, a, a prayer that says, if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And this is being realized through the program that we are doing now. We call the girls who are going through our program, have already begun graduating, they are going back to their villages, some of them are coming out as nurses and teachers, and they're beginning to already have an impact in that community. Where before we had no girls graduating at any level, we now have more than 200 girls on our secondary school program, all doing well and showing the little girls that they too can make it as well. What strikes me about all of these stories, and thank you so much for sharing them, is that sometimes this problem, girls' education and changing the world for girls, seems so insurmountable. And the reality is, as your stories have all highlighted, it starts with one girl. And that's where you have to start. And over time, you can achieve so much for generations of girls. And that's what's so inspiring. So thank you for sharing those stories. Maggie, if I could turn to you for a second and get a little bit more tactical around this idea of advocacy for girls' education. Could you talk a little bit about the use of social media technology as a way to be, be more effective as an advocate for this issue? Sure. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. So, uh, well, for me personally, when I started, I was just 18 or 19 years old. I was really young, um, very young social entrepreneur. I knew nothing, so I really had to read. And this was in the era of 28 now, so this is 10 years ago, when Twitter, I don't even think was out yet, Instagram, not a thing, Facebook had just sort of emerged. Um, what I did is I started a little Squarespace blog, and that blog initially was just to keep like my grandma and my aunts and my friends in touch with my journeys along the world. But what happened was, is I really started telling my journey and the stories of the people I had seen and kids and um, slowly, little by little, it, I don't know, snowballed and people started reading it. And, um, you know, we jumped on the Facebook bandwagon and started telling stories of the girls and slowly, I don't know, Cosmo Girl did a piece and our website crashed, like that little blog that I started when I was 19 and girls were writing in from social media saying like, I was struggling with depression and when I saw your story, it just made me realize that I could do something. So over the course of 10 years, yeah, we've been able to build a following, but also just like what I've learned is that it doesn't always have to be the serious story of like the rape victim or the child marriage. Sometimes it can be like the funny, and, and I've seen a lot more success with like, this is what my eight-year-old said today in class, or really finding the joy. And, and yeah, there are the sad days, but mostly, I don't know if anyone else has seen this in, in the developing world, but there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of happiness. And I found a lot more success in sharing the positivity and the funny anecdotes of my children and our students at our school. And that's what I've really learned is like keeping it super positive and because it is, like this work is fun. Um, it's actually interesting because before you came in, we saw the preview for the, the trailer for the He Named Me Malala film and mm -hmm. it got laughs because of course Malala is a girl and she laughs with her brothers and she makes jokes and she has that side of her as much as she is, of course, this incredible symbol and advocate for girls' education. So yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Um, Maria, I know that most recently you've uh, compiled um, a communique to focus on girl stories and specifically the language that we use when we as their representatives tell their stories. So I was wondering if you could spend a couple minutes talking about the lessons that you've learned in compiling that information for all of the attendees here. Sure. Um, so when, uh, this, when Africa first started this work, um, in 2010, one of the one of the things that uh, African was doing was doing these digital stories. So the girls were telling their story in digital format, and um, and these were very, very, very personal, private stories. Personal stories about their journey, about situations that they've been in, crisis situations, experiences that they've had. Um, abuse that they, you know, suffered, you know, you name it, fill in the blank. They were telling those stories. So 
So then, you know, we had these videos. It's like, is it our story to tell? Is it for us to share these very private and personal moments that these young ladies have experienced, you know, in, in, in their culture and in their world? It's not our story to tell. Um, so we've, we've made a very conscious you know, and intentional decision to keep those stories private, to respect their dignity, to respect their space, um, and not to share some of those you know, real heart-wrenching stories. Because what if we're sharing these stories out there on social media and you know, on our website and whatnot, and the young lady who's telling her story eventually becomes a, um, you know, the next prime minister of Tanzania, <laughs> or the next, you know, powerful female figure in Tanzania, and all of a sudden, this story is out there. So, so we've decided uh, over the last, you know, six months or so. Well, actually. Over the last couple of years, we've decided, well, we're not going to share those, you know, those digital stories as powerful as they may be. Those are stories that they get to tell to whomever they choose to tell. It's not up to us to disseminate those stories. Um, but what we do, what we did decide is that we're going to tell the stories of how they're transforming themselves, how they're transforming their communities, how powerful they are, how, um, that they are agents of change, that they're resilient. So we're using language that's powerful. We're not going to use language that demeans them or language that erodes their dignity. The opposite. We're going to use language that is uplifting, that shows them as the powerful young ladies that they are, as capable, and as agents of change. Um, so we've been very intentional in, in this, and we've developed now for Africade a communication guideline that basically kind of, you know, talks about how we're going to how we're going to tell stories about uh, the young ladies in Tanzania, these amazing scholars that are doing so much for themselves and for their communities. Um, the other thing that we've also chosen to do is to respect their privacy and protect their privacy. So we developed a child protection policy that you know volunteers who go over there have to sign. Uh, staff members have to sign, um, you know, I have to sign, and, and, and all of these things. Um, and then the other thing we've decided to do, too, is that we're only going to use their first names. We're not going to use first and second name, uh, because again, you know, what if they become the, you know, the <laughs> a, a, a key figure in Tanzania, and all of a sudden, you know, there's all of these stories out there that anybody on, you know, on the internet can Google their name and all of a sudden, you know, all this stuff comes up. So we're being very deliberate in respecting their privacy. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I know that one question that has come up from the attendees here is how girls from, how girls are chosen for the She's the First scholarships as part of your program. And so I'm wondering if we could take a little bit of time for each of you to address that. Or how do you even, how do you choose the girls who come into the schools themselves? In general. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so basically, you know, what we do is we have an application process, and also the girls have to uh, go through an interview process, and that's to get into our uh, our Kisa leadership program. Um, so basically, all the girls that are in our program have already gone through that um, application and interview process, and then that's that's the group that um, also then gets selected for the Shisa for scholarships. And our process is also really similar. Throughout the year, um, we take in sort of like a waiting list of kids who come in and who are eligible in order to apply for a scholarship at Coppola Valley. Generally, you have no mother, no father. That we're primarily an orphan care school. Um, but also, there's other situations like seven kids in the family. And so obviously, two or three of them may not get the chance to go to school, or various other begging kids who have a handicapped guardian. So it's pretty, um, you know, we'll get 1,200, 600, 700 applicants each year, um, and then we run an admissions period, and we'll just select 20 to 30 of the most needful and sort of merit-based um, candidates who we think can take the scholarships and really run with them and work hard and, and stick with them. And we look for, 
also like a little bit of a spark, like do they believe in themselves? Are they really gonna take this opportunity and, and fly with it? Because I'm sure like Africade, we're looking for future leaders and people who can wear that badge, that she's the first badge and be really proud. And um, But yeah, there's a whole selection process and interview and then you do a home visit, you trek to the village, you get all the documents together. It's pretty extensive. Um, and there's more girls out there. <laughs> uh, like Maggie's program, uh, we, we do have fewer places than the applicants who get into our program. Uh, we can only admit about uh, 50, uh, 50 students into our school every year. Uh, a year ago, we had 600 applications for those places. Uh, it's actually easier for girls to come into our program because uh, as I say, we make sure equal numbers of boys and girls into the program. There are normally fewer girl applicants, so the chances of girls of fact coming to the school are much, much higher. Uh, we have some limitations, only one student per family to spread the number of opportunities across the entire community. Uh, we look at how long they have worked from school. We look at the, uh, whether their parents uh, able to let them come to school, and we do sign an agreement to the parents that if their girl is admitted to a school, they must let this girl come to school every day. They can do some housework over the weekends and late in the evenings, but every day they must come to the school and be given the chance to do homework when they go back home, and for the parent to come to school when called to do parent-teacher discussions, to participate in activities at the school, so the parents are involved in the school itself. So we make the atmosphere, especially the school, very welcoming to the girls. But once they are in the school, then the opportunity to become a, a, a she's the first sponsor is sort of basically based on me. We don't sort of rank them. Once they are in the school, uh, we ask the school to give us the list of the most needed students at that time, and then they're paired uh, with uh, the requirements that we have. But it's, it's especially important for us that we make sure that the parents are supportive of their girls as much as possible. Once they come to the school, the parents must commit to making sure that the girls have all the opportunities. And if there's a challenge, we have mentors and counselors at the school who will talk to the girl, but also bring the parents in and talk to them so the girls have the best opportunity to remain at school. Thank you so much. And uh, before we turn to your questions, I had one sort of forward-looking question for all of you. Given that we're sitting here in 2015, I'm wondering what you hope advocacy will achieve, let's say, in 15 years' time. You know, so in, in many instances, the most effective advocacy is that that is very specific, that is trying to reach a very particular goal. So are there very specific advancements that you would like to see happen for girls in your village, in your countries, and in the places in which you work? Uh, we, we begin our program by letting the girls know that the best advocate for their issues is themselves. Uh, you heard Maria talk about girls in Africa. They are always very quiet. They sort of put themselves down. They, when they talk to you, they don't. Culturally, you don't look someone in the eye in Africa when you are talking to them. You sort of, the girls look down, look sideways, and they are very, very timid. Uh, that's one thing that we have tried from the very, very beginning to tell our girls, you are the best advocates for yourself. You must have to be assertive. And it's a special privilege for us that we get volunteers from here, young people like you who travel to Uganda every year to come and work at our school for two weeks. And when they see their peers from the US, you know, young girls like you talking to them, the way you connect yourselves, the way you sort of talk around, the way you relate to others, they are beginning to learn how to conduct themselves. But they, and then when other girls in the village look at our girls who come to our school and see how they are speaking in front of the public, how they are sort of expressing themselves, what issues they are raising. That is helping spread the message of assertiveness across the community. And we, as I said earlier, we talk to the parents, we talk to the teachers, we say you must let these children be able to speak up. If it's a classroom discussion, you have to allow them to speak up. And we use our teachers, we use the resources we have, we take the girls out to go visit our communities, but also work with authorities, because I mentioned the power figures in the community, the teachers, the government leaders, the church leaders. 
So this is the 21st century when a very different environment than away 40 years ago. We need to make sure that we give equal opportunity to everybody, but also to realize the world is changing. When we try to bring people from here to go to Uganda and talk to these kids, because we want, we, it's a very interconnected world. We cannot allow ourselves in Africa to continue lagging behind all the time. The world is leaving just behind. I know the social media and all these things bring us together. We have to allow communities to catch up with the rest of the world. So hopefully in 15 years from now, the differences that we see now will no longer be there, but we have to work towards that goal. It will not just happen by itself, we have to be the advocates for that change. I agree completely. I am, <clears throat> I'm so hopeful about the direction that things are going in. Even in 10 years since I've been in the field, in Nepal alone, I think 27% of girls were enrolled in primary school 10, 15, 20 years ago. That number has now reached 80 to 90%. That's huge in a decade. And we, what we don't know is what it's like to have an educated generation of girls and women because there isn't one right now in the world. I work with a lot of women. We run a women's empowerment center, and I co-raise my children with Nepali women. And um, they all say to me, none of them went to school. And they're just like, your girls are so lucky. In our village, there wasn't a single girl who went to school. Not a single one. They didn't know of girls going to school. And then they look at our children, and they're like, they're so empowered. They're so free. And obviously, I think that Nepal has a long way to go, but it's really hopeful to think about that, that we've never seen a world where there was a generation of women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who were educated, free, empowered, or could read and write. We don't know what it looks like to have a village of women who can all sign their name on a bank account or a check. So we're about to move into a whole new world of, I've been singing Disney a lot lately. <laughs> 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 I was Aladdin. I have a one year old. <laughs> Where just like, Children and, and these girls are going to be the leaders, and I think it's so cool. And just one last thing, that you were talking about social media. Ten years ago, well, I guess sometimes when I see the news, I'm like, there's so much evil, there's so much bad, there's so much ick, like the woman who was beaten by her father and was hanging from the tree, like all of these news lines, that Malala being shot in the face. Um, but you know what? That stuff has been happening for centuries. We just didn't know about it. There's not more bad news on the news. We just know about it instantly now. Cecil the Lion, great example. Nobody's going to be able to get away with this stuff much longer. That's, that's my hope, because we're going to know about it instantly, and there's going to be more accountability for how we treat women and, and girls. So I don't know. The bad news is so depressing, and sometimes it makes me feel like I've been kicked in the stomach, but also just say to yourself, well, at least we know about these things happening and now it's our time to do something. And to summarize, I'm gonna build, up on, build on what John said and what Maggie has said. John said how important it is for girls to find their voice and to be able to speak up for themselves and advocate for themselves. Maggie talked about how we're raising this next generation of women leaders. I'm gonna talk about what Hopefully, well, no, no, there's no doubt about it. I'm going to talk about what this next generation of women leaders are actually going to do in their community. So this generation of women leaders that we're all, all working to, 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 to raise, to, 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 um, to assist, to, to bring forward, this generation of women leaders, they're going to work on improving sanitation for young girls so that when they start their menstrual cycles, they don't have to stay home five days a month and eventually they drop out. They're gonna find solutions to that problem of menstrual hygiene. They're gonna find solutions to sanitation at schools so that there are hand washing stations, so that there are latrines available that are dedicated to girls so girls and boys don't have to share and fight over which latrine they're gonna use or stand in line for a half hour before they can use their latrine. They're gonna solve those problems. They're gonna solve the problem of transition rates from primary school to secondary school where the majority of the girls drop out. 
in Tanzania, by the time a girl is 15 years old, um, about 67% of girls are no longer going to school. So our generation, the generation of girl leaders that we're all working to, to, to raise, they're going to solve that problem. They're going to solve the problem of transition rates from secondary school to university. They're going to figure out what it takes to break down all of those barriers that they faced and that they continue to face today. But in 15 years, they're the ones that are going to, that are going to be solving those problems. Thank you so much, all of you. And I think we can now turn to some of the burning questions that you all in the audience have for our panelists. Um, I think we just have to get it loaded up here. There we go. Okay, so we have a specific question for John. Have you had blowback from the government or other male figures in the community as part of doing your work? Uh, likely not, because we began this program by saying this is going to be a collaborative process between us and the government. So from, and it, it works that way. You sort of have to work with the government. The very, very first event we did was to invite the government officials to officiate at the opening ceremony. Whenever we travel to Uganda, we have teams going to Uganda, we ask them to meet with the government officials first. If you elevate this, okay, they, they like to be seen, you know, that you're giving them the respect, that you're working with them, you're collaborating with them. So they, they like being involved. Uh, and secondly, because our program is so successful, the credit eventually goes back to government because these kids have to sit uh, a national exam to go to the next level. Uh, the students are ranked when they pass, and the districts that do well are sort of given credit and praise and their names and the radio and the newspaper. So our district has been performing better and better because of this program, and the government officials are getting credit because the district is getting you know, good uh, references and so on. So they are happy to work with us, and we know for the long-term interest of the program and our students and the community, we need to work with government. And so we bring them in, we share with them, we allow them to make some of the decisions like where our resources should go. When our volunteers go to work in Uganda, work with them, sort of say, you know, go work in these local schools. We introduce them to the government officials. You know, so if you do it in a collaborative way, it works out for the good of everybody. Absolutely. It's a very, very important question. And of course, we know so many recent efforts have really looked to include men as part of the conversation because they recognize how vital they are in the overall sustainability of some of these solutions being implemented in the community. Can I ask you a question from Maggie as well? Sure, sure, absolutely. The men? <laughs> okay. I know why you want to ask me. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've had mixed sort of feelings. All of the women in my village are like, Maggie, you are so manly. You are such a man. And I don't think I could be any more feminine. Um, but you know why they put that masculine um, sort of uh, adjective on me is because I actually do look people in the eye and I look at men and I talk to them very openly and hold them accountable. But they, I think also because I was young, a lot of, some of the men I would say were a little bit protective of you know, not wanting me to get taken advantage of. Um, it also really helps that we have a board of men and women. And my co-director, co-founder is, is a male. Um, I'm raising boys with girls. Um, so yeah, I think including men in the conversation and whatever I do, whenever I get a little pushback, I say, well, what if it was your daughter? Or what if it was your son that this was happening to? And I always just, boom, put it back on them. And dads love their daughters 99.9% .9 of the time. So sometimes you just have to get them to think a little more. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do the applicants find out about these opportunities at your schools? Is there an outreach program? We talked a little bit about <coughs> the process to select them. But how do they even find out about the opportunity to become a She's the First Scholar? Um, so, because we've had our programs now in schools um, for about um, five years now, um, we now have a, a uh, alumni of the programs. We also have, since it's ours is a two-year program, we have the second-year uh, scholars 
who will um, spread the word to the first year scholars. Um, our girls, our second year scholars will put on skits to kind of talk about um, the program and tell, you know, tell the younger girls how to apply. Um, so there's this kind of now, um, kind of a, I don't know how to call it, uh, a process where the older girls are getting the younger girls excited and you know like yeah you know it's the club to belong to it's so cool and we get a t-shirt <laughs> radio newspaper village to village um word of mouth other kids yeah <clears throat> our program has been in existence for 10 years now almost everyone in the community knows about it they know this is the place to go uh to get a good education uh the She's the first is sponsors at this time, 93 kids uh, at our school. So they're pretty well known in the school and they, were, they became more well known when Christine and Kate visited uh, about a year and a half ago. They are rock stars in the village and yeah. she has promised to come back again in, in February. <laughs> but yeah, because of this, because of connections like this and because these girls are uh, special mentor, they come together, they talk about issues, they hear about kids. So they, they stand out because they are learning things and doing things that make them role models in their own community. Fantastic. This is a really great question that's come in about who are the teachers who are teaching at your school? Do they come from the local community? Do they come from other countries? Sort of where do you recruit them? Uh, very good question. We began by saying we want local teachers because we want these teachers to relate with the kids and to know the environment. Uh, it, it didn't work out, unfortunately, because when you have learned things in a certain way and you have done things in a certain way for so long, it's very difficult to change. So we had to get teachers from out of the community. We built for them a house so they could live there, but we had to bring teachers from the city who taught in a different way, who knew things in a different way, who could do things different, because we want to transform this community, and we just couldn't do the same things over and over again. And in our case, we are lucky because we're able to get teachers from here, from the US. Every summer, when schools close here, a number of teachers and young people, young people like you, some are university students, some are high school students, some are recent graduates, they come to Uganda and work at our school. Uh, we have formed partnerships with the uh, Cell College uh, up in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have, uh, uh, sorry, Massachusetts, sorry. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, uh, Merrimack University in Arlington, and teachers from there, as well as students from there, travel to Uganda and work at our school, and they share their stories, and they teach the students new things. We have one of our students here who, from the cell who came to Uganda and worked there for two weeks. So that makes a difference when students and teachers from here go there and show them a different way of learning, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, reading to kids, playing together, sharing stories. The, the, the transformative effect is immediate, obvious, and long-lasting. And when we go out to the community and work with local teachers and local schools as well, because our goal is transformation, not just for our kids, not just for one school, but for the area as a whole. Providing that insight. We, you guys are asking so many great questions that the panelists are racing to try to answer them. So we're going to skip around a little bit. Um, Maggie, in particular, wanted to address this idea of the, the recent arguments about the negative effects of volunteerism and how, what effects, if any, have you witnessed around this issue? Yeah, this one's really personal for me because I, my whole life started with volunteerism. Um, so when I see the articles, it's like, oh. Uh, this one gets Can you me. Say a little bit more about that. So even where before Nepal, before your gap year, where did that start? Yeah. So um, I started with a gap year, okay. and basically you're with a group of 11 kids. It's what these articles online are all sort of attacking right now. And you go around and you rebuild a seawall with the villagers, and you go and you live on a Buddhist monastery, and you plant trees on a marae. Like that's that was my how my whole journey started. So. When there's the attack against volunteerism, it's really hard not to feel that it's a personal attack. <laughs> However, now that I'm on the other side, running an organization, and I bring in volunteers, I do see the need to really culturally prepare um, our volunteers and people we bring into our remote 
project in Nepal and let them know like these are the things you need to be sensitive about. These are the things that are going to shock you. These are the things, sorry, but you cannot show your shoulders. Like, um, and I've really realized that having volunteers for two weeks for my kids and what they need isn't that easy. Usually we're asking for like a six month or a one year commitment. So I've been able to see both sides and I think the answer is not, well, let's just stop wealthy, like Western kids going to the developing countries. I don't think that that's the answer. I think we need to raise a generation of more culturally, and I think we're doing that, sensitive um, students who can go to a remote village in East Africa or Nepal and or South America and really know what they're getting into and know how to use the right language and how to you know be sensitive and have those conversations that are a lot of times really difficult and kind of be willing to learn and make mistakes and and just prepare as much as possible but I can talk about this for hours <laughs> about the things that I've seen people do and you're like no that's not what you do here no <laughs> And so, so find Maggie if you want to get more detail about <laughs> what not to do. Um, and I know Maria, you wanted to address the question about what jobs are available to graduates once they leave your program. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. So um, our program basically is really preparing girls to go on to university. And about 96% of the girls who graduate from our two-year program enroll in university. But what we're seeing, oh, and we actually had our first batch of, uh, we had 20, our first cohort of, of young women who graduated from university this year. We had 22 girls graduate from university who started the program in 2010. So that's really, really exciting, yes. Um, but what we're finding is that um, there, there's a, the statistic is crazy. And sometimes I wonder if I'm saying the right numbers, but I think it's some crazy number, like 900,000 uh, young people enter the workforce every year, and they're fighting for 60,000 jobs in the formal sector. I might be wrong about that statistic, so please don't quote me and have to look online to make sure I got the numbers right, because it's still like, really? Uh, but it's like a huge discrepancy of the number of young people entering the workforce and how many jobs are actually available for them. So what we're doing to address this issue is, um, first of all, having a university degree does not ensure that you will have a job in the formal sector. Um, we're, there's a lot of university graduates that will not find a job. So what we're doing to address that is we are, uh, we've created an alumni program, and so through that alumni program, we are you know, helping the girls, uh, the graduates network with other uh, organizations that are in the area so that you know, they can um, have those job opportunities. They're being introduced to people who may be, you know, may be employers in the future. Um, we're also continuing to provide them with personal and professional development workshops through the alumni network. And then the other thing that we're doing is we're going to launch a business planning resource center so the girls can come um, and go through a, uh, a business planning uh, program. They'll be matched with a local business woman, woman who will be a coach or a, you know, a mentor for them as they go through their own business planning process for those that want to start their own business and become job creators themselves. And what is so interesting about all of your models, I know all of you address not only the need for girls to go to school, but everything else that they need, the, the surrounding factors that prevent girls from continuing and completing successive years of education, health care, job training, so that the education can be relevant in the workplace, um, et cetera. So it's, it's a very similar aspect of all of your models. Um, one other question that came up is, what is the most challenging aspect about running a school? Uh, the, 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 this thing, first of all, for us, it's the biggest challenge is that we can't take everyone who comes to our school. We would love to do more, because taking for, uh, 50 kids out of 600 applicants is just too little. The kids who get turned away from our school, they really have nothing, nowhere to go, because when they go to a local school, there's not a whole lot of learning that goes on there. 
So we would love to do more. We are trying to grow our program by doing outreach, by expanding our resources, by, uh, you know, um, we're excited to work with Shizzy first because they're going to give us more opportunities to reach more and more girls. So we love to work with you all to make this a bigger and better program. Uh, but running the schools, as long as you have, the students are very eager to learn. I mean, these kids come to our school every day at 7.30 in the morning. Some of them walk five miles to reach school. They live home when it's dark. They start school up to 6 p.m. They go back home when it's dark. But there's no better place for them than to be at school. The kids love being at school. Even on Saturdays, they come to school. So it's, a, it's just a pleasure teaching these kids and working with them. And it's even more joyful to see them graduate through life. 100% of our kids graduate from our school and go to secondary school. Uh, they finish secondary school. We now have 60 kids at university who have gone through our program. The very, very first time that we have a group of students from this community go all the way to university. When they graduate, they are going to come back and work in this village and this community. So in a very few, very few short years, we are going to have a group of well-trained, educated kids who have gone through our program, who are coming back to actually lead and work on the program and transform their community. So it's always a pleasure. And see this taking root across the community, local schools, local communities, embracing our mother and wanting to do the same. So it's not difficult running a school to get the resources and trying to make sure that you have what you need to have an effective program. We have people who are committed to doing that and we're looking forward to growing and expanding this program even more. Um, well, I was gonna go off, I agree with everything John said and what you said, Tara. Um, if it was just that simple as giving a kid a uniform and being like, it's your first day of school, yay, snap a photo, you're five and everything in the world is great. Um, but, oh my gosh, the things that happen that, again, you can't really talk about because it's private and they're their stories. Um, I just, it's hard. It's really, really hard work. And as a founder and someone who runs a school, this is where I have to say, like, that's when I have you guys. And I think about Tammy working her butt off for me, and I think about Kristen, and I think about all of you on chapters, because the reality is, is like the life of, that some of our kids have all over the world right now, it's not fair and it's not right. And when you're there on the ground, on the front lines, troubleshooting, and oh, this girl got married off, and this little girl's backpack got burned by her drunk dad, like thing after thing, where you almost wake up and you're like, did that really happen? Come on, like all plans for the day just out the window. Um, but that's when, as a founder, to know that all of you are there just rallying and doing the fundraising so that I don't have to do it and I can be there for my kids and, and, and they're doing that work. Um, I have to say that it does, it does mean a lot to us and it's hard, there's no, even like I'll go and I'll speak at the World Bank and the UN and they want like a secret sauce. Like they want, snap your fingers and it's better. Put on the uniform, send the girl to school. And it's just not easy. It's really complicated. You need to fix the home life. You, she needs to be tutored so that she can, the, the critical learning periods that she missed, she can get up to speed. She needs to be safe. She needs to protect, be protected. She needs to have clean water. The government needs to clean its act up. There needs to be roads. There needs to be access. Like. The, it's long term. Yeah. Really, the teachers need to be better. Absolutely, it's yeah. not just as easy as, as building a school and opening the doors and everything comes. It's long term, incredibly complex work. Yeah, no yeah. way around that. Right. Yeah. Maria, do you have anything to add to that question around your challenges? Um, well, I think the question was about running schools, and Africate does not run schools, but we partner with already existing schools, so our situation is a little bit different. Great. Um, so there's a question about, one more question. <laughs> I'm going to exercise my, my moderator role. You know what, we should end on, where's that one that I saw? As students in the U.S., what should our role in advocacy be? A really important question and a, an appropriate one to end on. Um, so you guys have a very powerful voice. Um, and a voice that reaches far and wide in your communities. 
I think your role is to inform yourselves, inform yourselves as best you can of what the issues are, um, and present those issues. I think also for you to, to look at um, the, the relationship that you have with your peers that are in, you know, in Tanzania or in Nepal or in Uganda or in Guatemala or in Ethiopia or um, all of these other uh, countries where uh, the She's the First Partners are. You know, these are your peers uh, or, you know, or will become your peers. Um, and it's to think of them, you know, as having a relationship that's eye to eye. That just because you live here in the United States does not necessarily mean that your life is any better than their life. Um, they have joy in their life. They have you know, wonderful moments in their life. Yes, they experience hardships, but so do you. Um, so it's, it's to realize that you really, you really are equals to each other. Um, your challenges are different. But they're all challenges. And so it's the spirit of solidarity that you can kind of create, that you're all in it together, that you're all there to support each other uh, and to reach hands across and support your peers that are in a different cultural situation. Um, but don't minimize the challenges that you have also. Just that, you know, don't, it's like, we're, we're all here on this earth and we experience our own personal challenges and they're challenges to us, right? Uh, we all have bad days. They have bad days too. We all have bad days. So we're here together to help each other out, to support each other, and to make each other's lives as best as possible. But you know, there there isn't like, oh, just because we live in the United States, you know, our life is so much better. And oh, those poor people that are living in you know Tanzania, their life must be horrible. That's not that's not the way to look at it. The way to look at it is, we are here together. This is, you know, our beautiful earth, and we're going to help each other out as best we can. I don't know if you saw, you're getting huge thumbs up from Kristen in the back. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that resonated with her. Me That's too. Amazing. I got goosebumps. I yes. actually wrote right. down every single quote, I know. and I was going to all of that. <laughs> right. It's being right. recorded. Good. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, yeah, I. I'm gonna go off what you said, and then I wanna say one other thing. My 14-year-old came here. Uh, she did a semester in the US, and um, that was really cool for me because she was, at the end of a few months, a lot of the Americans were like, oh, she must not wanna go back to Nepal. She's had it so easy here. And my 14-year-old was like, could not have been more ready to go back to Nepal. She was ready to go home, just like, if we were abroad somewhere, at the end of it, you'd be ready to go home. And it was hard to explain that to people, that she has a very happy, joyful life. Um, but how to be an effective advocate to you, all what I want to say is change the dialogue, change the channel when you know that you need to. There is so much garbage and distraction. Rip the pages out of the magazine. like. We, that's our job. I had a conversation with VH1, and they have those trashy television shows that you're just like, oh, it's disgusting. It's, it's gross that we even watch them. And I know some of you do, because my sister does, it's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they looked at me, and I, and I was saying something, because the VH1 was like, well, what can we do to make the world better and change it, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I kind of gave them a little bit of a dig at some of their programming. And they said, well, you all watch it. It's, we're just giving the, the people who watch these shows what they want. And so I think what we need to do as a generation is show the advertising companies and the conversations and just in our conversations with each other what it is that's important and on social media and the conversations that we have with each other and the conversation that we have with ourselves. Like, you know when you're looking in the mirror and thinking about, oh, I look ugly today, or I'm fat, or this. It doesn't, like, we need to focus on what's important, believe in ourselves, believe in our voice, believe in our ability to change. And when you're fi you find yourself in a conversation that's just, like, not important, 
keep the dialogue where it needs to be, which is we need to be more kind, more compassionate, and we need to make the world better, or else I really don't want to be here. Like, that's just how it is. So keep, we need to do it. We have to be the generation that puts extreme poverty and the way that girls are be tr being treated, and we need to end it forever. Because I don't want to be old and looking back and not thinking that we did enough. I, I have the greatest belief and appreciation of this generation here. You are changing the world. You are a, gener a generation that is growing up without prejudice. You are a generation that is growing up very connected, very global, very effective. You know how to use the tools at your disposal. You know how to make friends and make connections and sort of see the world as one small place. You are the most effective advocates of change in the world. Uh, yesterday we had some powerful speakers. We had Anna speak. Anna wants to be a teacher. We had Andrea speak. Andrea wants to be a businesswoman and entrepreneur. We had uh, Jessica speak. The girls that you had speak here yesterday are exactly the same kind of girls that we have in this country across the world. Those, those girls want to be just exactly like you. They have the same dreams. They have the same passions. They have the same desires. They see themselves as you. And they're looking for friends, for partners, for people who can share their dreams with them. I have seen those girls when they meet their friends from here who visit them and how they embrace each other and how they play and how close they get together. You find girls and if they just want to come and touch and feel you, how does that feel? How do you feel? It's, it's, there's no difference at all. Those girls are just like you. And so we want to be sure that we tell the world that these are the same people. Just because they grew up in Tanzania or Nepal or the Tamara or wherever, you are the same people with the same dreams, with the same passion, with the same vision. And there's no better person to tell the world than you. You can talk to your parents, you talk to your community, you talk to your school friends, spread the message because you know what, I have the biggest confidence in your generation. I've seen you work, I've seen you work long hours and do great things. And the future for me is brighter because of you and because of what you're capable of doing. You are going to change the world. <laughs>